Hello and welcome to episode 124 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Los Angeles. I'm Nathan Fox. With me in Washington, D.C. is Ben Olson. What's going on, Ben? Oh, not a whole lot. It's gotten warm again, so it's nice. Oh, wow. Springtime in January, huh? Yeah. How long is that going to last? Oh, you know, maybe a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been uh, a lot warmer than it was. It was in the teens, and now it's back in like 45, 50 range. So it's much more pleasant. Wow, <laughs> nice. Anything exciting going on in your world? Um, No, just trying to navigate school and... Uh, kids are going to different schools next year, probably. So, just trying to get ready for that. And nothing super crazy. What sort of preparations do you have to do? Uh, <clears throat> so there are some schools in our area that have like I don't know. I guess it's advanced placement or something uh-huh. like that. So we have to do testing and figure out which program makes the most sense for them and. Put them into that program. I see. Makes sense. A lot of bureaucratic paperwork, basically. Cool. That sounds uh, like a lot of work. <laughs> oh, it's riveting. I can't imagine having one kid, let alone four. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you're going to say about that. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's every day is a new day. So. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, uh, today on the show, we are going to answer a bunch of listener emails. A um, couple little announcements slash promos here at the front of the show. Uh, our U- YouTube channel is officially up and running, and there's a link on thinkinglsat.com, but the address on YouTube is now uh, youtube.com slash thinkinglsat. So we have uh, our own custom thing. Thanks for subscribing. Um, If you haven't done so already, you can really help us out by still going to YouTube and just clicking the subscribe button. More subscribers uh, helps more people find us. So that's an easy way you can help the show if you're so inclined. Um, If you happen to be an Android person and you use Stitcher, we are available on Stitcher as well. Um, We don't have any reviews there or any comments or very many followers or whatever. Um, So you can also help us out by going to Stitcher and just... uh, Drop us a quick review if you can. Uh, It really helps us with uh, outreach for the show because we don't have budget for advertising. Um, I guess we just dive straight into these emails, huh? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. All right. Why don't you tackle this first one? Sure. Call me Ravender. Is that how you say say that name? Ravinder. Ravinder. Okay. Call me Ravinder because that's my name. And I'm not in the witness protection program. I liked that joke. Yeah. <laughs> That's really yeah. funny. I think people get a little too cagey about their uh, not using their real name on a podcast. One, no one's listening. And two, no one cares even if they do listen. So I think you can feel free to use your real name most uh, most times on the show. But anyway, <laughs> thanks for being here. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Nathan and Ben. What kind of donation would you like? Would it take for you guys to tackle a fresh LR section? I know the LSAC charges for using their materials, but what kind of ballpark donation would I and maybe the listeners have to make to cover that cost? Unfortunately, um, Ravinder, we can't talk about other LR sections on the podcast, even if we paid LSAC. I, uh, I don't think we can, at least. No, we would have to amend our licenses with our respective licenses with the LSAC. We would have to basically get permission. And I just, I can't see how they would possibly give us permission to read LSAC questions uh, on the show because we are supposed to pay per per copy we make. And so what would that be, like per download of the show? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> In which case it would be just thousands and thousands of dollars that we would have to pay. So um, it's just, and anyway, they wouldn't approve it. I'm pretty sure if we told the LSAC, hey, we have a podcast, they would be like, pod what? <laughs> and uh, I just don't see that ever happening. It's a bummer because it would be great to talk about more LR questions on the show. Yeah, so let's let's do a little number crunching here for a second. How many um, times does a single episode get? I, I think the yeah. most recent ones have been getting maybe four or 5,000 downloads by the time it's all said and okay. done, yeah. Okay, so let's say we talk about one LR sure, question. Yeah. 
Yeah. So let's say it's a five cent question. So five thousand times five cents is hmm, it's two hundred fifty dollars for that episode, assuming they would agree to that. <clears throat> I think they'd be wigged out by the digital nature of the podcast. Yeah, but, there'd be no way that um, I mean they would have to have like an audio stamp on top of it somehow. You know what I mean? <laughs> it would break yeah. in and it would be like Psh, uh, this is LSAC licensed property. Psh, you are not allowed to distribute <laughs> like every ten seconds. <laughs> LSOC does not endorse the uh, advice associated with this question. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So 250 bucks a question, uh, according to Ben's uh, back of the envelope calculation there. Yeah. yeah. If we multiply that by 25, you're talking about $6,000 for one section. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it's not happening. And uh, <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, Ravinder continues, I took the, an LSAT course in person and did not see my score improve at all. I crashed and burned on the 2017 September LSAT and scored a 152. After getting my score back, I had lost all hope and had no idea how I was going to improve my score. The thought being, I had already taken a course, got tutoring, and was studying four to six hours a day for three months. How can I mm. improve? That does hurt. Yeah, that does hurt. And that's a lot of studying. That right there is probably part Yeah, of the I mean, we see people who have taken a course previously all the time. Like that's that that isn't that doesn't surprise me that much. Where and I mean, I I understand the bummer of that too. It's like, well, I already took a class. Now I'm going to pay for another class. Like, yeah, well, if you already took a shitty class, mm, or it just didn't connect for you for whatever reason. But this is a bummer. Like he also got tutoring. Which is expensive. Yeah. So we take a took a course, got tutoring, and then the worst part of it is the four to six hours a day for three months. Oh my god, mm. that's the really costly part. Yeah, and probably led to some burnout. Right, you can't really focus that well uh, if you're studying that long. So then you're not getting that much out of your studying, which is why your score probably stayed the same. I think that's the biggest problem here, probably. I mean, it might have been the course, too, but the course didn't instruct Ravinder to slow it down. Yeah. Uh, Some of the big courses, you know, they they give you so much homework that it makes it look like you should be doing four to six hours a day. And I'm much more about the one hour, the first hour every day. If you do that first hour every day, I kind of don't care what else you do on top of that. And yeah. the four to six hours every day is like, yeah, how much is really going in by hour four or hour five? Um, in Angela Duckworth's book, Grit, she talks about deliberate practice. And she says that most people can only focus intensely the way they need to focus when you really want to make progress in something for at most an hour. So, you know. Four to six hours, that's just that's just crazy. It's certainly crazy when it's every day. I mean, that's just yeah. boy, you're Yeah, then again, lawyers work like twelve hours every day. So <laughs> get used yeah. to it. <laughs> so the the email continues. I listened to every thinking LSAT podcast twice. <laughs> Dude, Ravinder, you have like drive. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a lawyer to me. And took your lessons to heart, for example, doing time sections, doing meditation as part of my study routine, not reading the question first, and not rushing to finish sections. I have improved a lot, and I have hope of doing much better on the June LSAT. If nothing else, I won't freak out when it comes to test day. Maybe this time I'll take a leaf out of Nathan's book and watch fellow test takers freaking out and think to myself, hey, dummy, you're doing it wrong. (laughs) Glad I can help. Yeah. Yeah. In conclusion, thank you guys so much. The new mental attitude makes everything so much easier. It makes studying an hour a day civilized and not and much more productive, even though I study less than what I used to. Yeah. Couldn't agree this more. sounds great. Yeah. I'm happy about that. I mean, I, I could definitely feel the burnout, you know. I had lo- <laughs> after getting my score back, I had lost all hope. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's common. We see that. Uh, you're not alone in that, Ravinder. Um, but 152 is not like a terrible, terrible score. I mean, one, 152 has has hope for sure. There's room to improve yeah. off of a 152. And uh, you, 
you know, it sounds like you, you had some bad advice, you had some bad habits, and now you're back doing it in a much calmer way. And uh, yeah, I love that you're slowing down. I love that you're not worrying about finishing the sections. I think things are going to go much, much better for you. I mean, what, what score do you think you should be finishing the sections? Like at, at what kind of score? Oh, I feel like. 165 at least. Yeah, that's what I always say. 165 and maybe even 170. Because you can reach yeah. those scores without finishing the sections. Oh, for sure. I work with people all the time who write me and say, I didn't do the last question, last two questions on three of the sections, and I got a 169 or I got a 171. And it's like, yeah, because you're getting everything else right. You're just going through the section, getting them right, Time is up. Time is up. You're doing an easier version of the test because you're doing less questions, but you're just you're you're investing your time into those questions and you're you're figuring them out and you're getting them right. Then you randomly guess on everything you don't have time to finish and you still get some of those right. Yeah. Hey, I'm gonna interject here and be an asshole. No, what? You said less questions? Fewer. I'm still fewer, a big fewer, proponent fewer. of fewer. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. No, that's not an asshole. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely happy to be corrected on things like that. Yes, fewer questions. Thank you. If you don't know the difference between less questions and fewer questions, dear listeners, you should look it up. Um, <clears throat> cool. No, I agree with everything you said. Cool. Um, <clears throat> thanks for vendor for writing in. Um, good luck. Hey, Nathan and Ben. I am a new listener, so I apologize if you have covered this topic in the past. On the show, I've heard you talk a lot about how to pick... Oh, wait a second. You know what? I wanted to make a pitch, though. <laughs> Sorry. I forgot. Okay. Commercial. Yeah, go ahead. Commercial time. Um, <clears throat> Ravinder wants to know what kind of a donation it would take for us to tackle a fresh LR section. Yeah. Uh, we each cover hundreds of logical reasoning questions in our online classes. Yeah. So if you like what we do on the podcast, you will love what we do in our full classes online. You can check out mm -hmm. Ben's free class at strategyprep.com slash free. You can check out my free class at foxlsat.com slash free. And you can sign up for one or both of our full programs, uh, on our websites and you can get just so many of those similar uh, format logical reasoning explanations. So, yep. I mean, that's not a donation to the show. Um, but you know, if you're looking to make an investment in your score, because it is the primary determinant <laughs> of where you go to law school and how much you pay to go to law school, uh, that thousand dollars that you can invest in Ben's class or my class is, uh, I don't know. I kind of think it's a no brainer. So there you go, Ravinder. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, pimp ourselves a little bit. Okay. Back to the, um, back to the, this, uh, second email again. H hey, Nathan and Ben, I'm a new listener. So I apologize if you have covered this topic in the past on the show, I've heard you talk a lot about how to pick the right LSAT course and what you do in your courses. But I was wondering if you have any tips for people that don't have the financial means to take a course and want to self study. I'm a graduating senior, and I plan to take the June 2018 test so I can apply in the next admission cycle. I took a diagnostic test two months ago with zero prep and got a 157. I'm hoping for a 170 to 175 in June, and I don't have classes spring semester, so I'll have plenty of time to study for the LSAT. Based on recommendations I saw online so far, I've bought about 40 prep tests, the LSAT trainer, and of course, your, uh, your my uh, quick and dirty LSAT primer. That's, that, call, that book is called Introducing the LSAT, and it's like $9 on Amazon. Um, once I get closer to the test date and have saved up enough money, I plan to buy specific books for the sections that I am struggling with. My first question is, how do you recommend students that are self-studying start their prep? After I read the books I have and become familiar with question types, should I start with timed 
blind review or do all sections untimed before I review them? Whoa, okay, wrong, wrong, wrong. Mm -hmm. Also, do you think I should start by drilling specific question types or go through the prep tests in order one by one? Why don't we start there? Yeah, so the first thing you're going to want to do is take a timed 35-minute section and just start reviewing it. And then, well, do that for a couple weeks. <laughs> and then when you have extra time but you don't have 35 minutes to sit down and do a full section, start drilling specific question types to you know, get more familiar with those types, but in a context of how they fit into the test as a whole, right? So like... As you're drilling them, you're sort of like, oh, yeah, I remember doing this kind of question, and now I'm just getting a little bit better at it. But the real reality is you're only drilling them because you don't have time to do a full 35-minute section, maybe. Or you want to target something that is hard to target when you're doing a section. Yeah. I, you already, I mean, she already did a full test, which is great. I yep. mean, did you review the ones you missed? That was two months ago, so it's like a long time ago. I'm guessing she didn't review the ones she missed, which is a mistake. That's a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. But yeah. now she should start over with, you have 40 tests. Start doing those tests. And that honestly sounds like a lot. I'd probably do the, the most recent 20 and then save the others for like targeted practice. Yeah, many people don't need to do 40 prep tests. I mean, some people will do all 83 multiple times, but you don't yeah. the, the average person, I think at the when you get to 20 tests, you're probably seeing diminishing returns at that point. For most people, not everybody, but most people, your scores would have started leveling off. Or at least you should probably be taking the test officially, getting a score on record, and then, you know, thinking about whether you want to take it again and dig back into right. those tests. But it's kind of hard to do forty tests, yeah, between and not have anything to show for it. Yeah, between now and June, I mean, how many weeks is that? Roughly twenty, twenty-five weeks, just twenty weeks, guessing. Um, yeah, two tests a week would be 40 tests. I mean, I guess that's not like totally unreasonable between now and June, but you certainly don't need to do that many. And yeah, the, the magic formula is one section every day timed and thoroughly review your mistakes. Mm -hmm. Um, no such thing as an untimed section. Never, ever, ever do you do an untimed section. I, I think. Yeah, I agree. What when you're <laughs> when you're doing the section timed, uh, you don't want to necessarily finish. You just go through it at a good pace, a a pace in which you can understand what you're doing, and that gives you the opportunity, time and time again, to practice ignoring the timer. If you practice untimed and then jump into a timed setting, you will for sure. <laughs> have a disconnect and start going too fast or yep. overthinking things or whatever. So you just got to get used to ignoring the time. And the best way to practice is to start a timer. Right. You start the Take timer time. and you ignore it. You do your work. It's like the pace that you should go is the pace that you're going to go when you're a lawyer. Right. You have a mountain of work in front of you and you have to do that work accurately. Mm -hmm. So that's the pace that you should be going. You should be doing your work. You should be answering the questions. You should be figuring them out. It's like you don't go faster than you can go and get them right, right? You like you, there is a speed where you're going to get it done and you're going to get it done correctly. Well, that's the yeah. speed that you should go. Not slower than that because that would be stupid. Like mm -hmm. you, you figure it out and once you figure it out, then you answer it and you move on. But the the timer needs to be ticking so that you can desensitize yourself to that timer. Now, yeah. when time's up, by all means, um, take all day if you want to review that section. You can redo all the ones you struggled with, certainly all the ones you missed. You can finish the ones you didn't have time to get to during the 35 minutes. 
take all day if you want to review it, you know, dig in. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at a new section of a real official prep test, you should always be timing. Um, yeah. I also don't like this after I read the books I have and become familiar with question types. Mm -hmm. No, you can get familiar with question types by doing your 35 minute sections and just digging in. And I don't have any problem with someone reading a book alongside doing 35 minute sections. They do their 35 minute section, they review it and they have a little extra time. So they read something. It will give them insight into what they were just doing, but it's so much easier to get that insight in the context of having done the actual work as opposed to just doing it in the abstract. Yeah, and I guess that this is like the flip classroom model. I think we've talked about this before, but we both start with real actual questions and then we talk about the theory that's necessary to understand those questions or the theory that will help you understand those questions. Yeah. And it, the opposite of that is like a mountain of boring ass theory first and then the then the the actual questions, but I feel like it's just, it's boring and it's a waste of time to do all that theory stuff first. Yeah. Okay. Um, my second question is about burnout. Looking at different LSAT forums, I have seen a lot of people talk about how, as they got closer to the test date, they started seeing their practice scores dropping or felt that they were really tired of the LSAT by the time they got to test day, which might've affected their scores. Have any of your students experienced burnout while studying for the test? And do you have any tips for how to avoid it? Yeah, for sure. This happens all the time. And we were just talking about it with the Ravinder uh, correspondent. Um, you, <clears throat> you just have to be sensitive to it. I, I mean, if you're spending several hours a day back to back to back and you're feeling like it's a drag to – start studying again, those are all signs that you're probably doing too much and you'll actually benefit from taking a day or two off. The earlier you can catch it, the less time you have to take off to recover from it. Uh, but if you just go all in and never give up because you just have to keep doing something, then to recover, you might actually need to take more time off to sort of let your mind reset and get back into the test. And I've seen a lot of students who were studying too much I told them, hey, look, just stop studying for the next four or five days. And then when they come back, all of a sudden their score bounces back up because they're not thinking about, I don't know, sometimes they're thinking too much about strategy, sometimes they're just drained, they're not focused, and it's like they come back to the test with sort of a reset, a new perspective, and it makes things go so much easier. I mean, it's not always the, that case, but uh, yeah, just be sensitive to how you're feeling about studying and how much you're studying. Yeah. If you're doing it too much, then pull back. I treat yourself well. Yeah, I I like that. A little self awareness goes a long way. Um, I I have said this before, but boy, it just makes me think about it so much. And and I think there might be an analogy to other things besides golf. But um, I'm a dorky, you know, amateur golfer, and I uh, when I play too much golf, I like inevitably start to play like shit. <laughs> it happens every time. And I don't know what it is. Like I'm, I, I think I'm trying too hard. I'm worrying too much about my bad shots. I'm like, my expectations get too high. I think I can control everything. I start thinking about all this technical bullshit. And if I put the clubs away for a month, which I frequently do, and I come back to it a month later, then it's back to basics, just kind of easy, and boy, it goes so much better after not playing. Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe that's part of that burnout thing is like you've been doing this every day for months and months and months and you want it really mm -hmm. bad, but maybe you need, need some distance and some balance in your life and yeah. then come back to it. And all that work will pay off. I mean, I'll, <laughs> months of LSAT prep will help you. But if it's months in a row without any time off, um, yeah, you can you can start to just be like holding on to the reins a little too tightly. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Liz. P.S. I really love the show. You guys are super helpful, and your humor and advice are making the LSAT process a little less painful. Thanks, Liz. We really appreciate that. 
Hey guys, Nathan just responded to my question via tweet, but was hoping to further expand on it here. This is the next email. It's from Hopeful Splitter. I appreciate your guys' style of blunt, straight talk, and I don't want you to spare me here. If I don't have a chance, I don't have a chance. Just really curious what your take is. I have a 2.92 GPA from a good public university, econ, poli sci. Um, I guess the first two years were rough. That's good news if your later GPA is higher. A 173 LSAT. Okay, that's excellent. And not great softs. <laughs> Decent work experience, out of school for three years, but won't have any academic LORs. Uh, you have to get academic LORs. Um, in any case, with this profile, and maybe it would be helpful for other 3.0 170 splitters in general, where would you guys place my R range of reach target safety schools? Ugh. Um, it is far fetched for me to think about a full price seat in the bot. Is it far fetched for me to think about a full price seat in the bottom half of the T15? Uh, um, we get these questions all the time, right? What do we, <laughs> what do you want to say to this? It's called the LSAT GPA calculator, for one thing. Um, you just type LSAT GPA calculator into Google. You put in 2.92, and you put in 173, and you hit calculate, and it shows you your percentage chances of getting in to last year's class at like 100-plus law schools. Yeah. And if, you, if, the, if that calculator spits out like you're a 90-plus percent chance of getting in, then you're also a really big candidate for scholarships. Yep. Um, that's basically it. I mean, I, I think that this this has a pretty good chance, though. I, I would say with well, the 173, I think that's always a pretty good chance. Yeah, that's a good score. It's a, that's in the top one percent, so it's going to help. Yeah. Yep. Um, we also have an update email here. Uh, this is just in my inbox right now, but this is going to get launched into the podcast agenda. Okay. So, yeah, I'll read this one. Um, it says, Ben and Nathan, you mentioned on today's show that you were curious about the results from applicants who are extreme splitters. I thought I'd write in to give you guys an update on my applications. If you read this on the show, please censor my name and exact stats for anonymity, but you can tell listeners I have a truly garbage GPA, um, it's below 3.0, and a truly elite LSAT, it is uh, above 175. Yeah. I applied back in October. I applied to a couple local schools, a couple respectable state schools in my region, and most of the top 20 schools. I swung for the fences by applying to a ton of schools I thought would probably reject me. So far, I have only been rejected at one school, which is Texas. I have not been waitlisted anywhere. I have yet to hear a word from most of the schools in the top 20, but I have been accepted to UVA and Georgetown. I also got into some good state schools in my area and got some 90 to 100% discounts at my hometown law schools. If you want, I can give you the full scorecard once I hear back from everybody. Long story short, tell your low GPA listeners to get off the internet, get off the law school admissions predictors. Whoops, we just gave a recommendation for those. Get off TLS and Reddit, put down the Ouija board, put away the tarot cards, stop reading the tea leaves, and just study for the LSAT. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And that's a censored. Um, so yeah, so let's see. So that's accepted to UVA in Georgetown with less than a 3.0 and a 170 something. Yeah. Um, so then back to, back to, uh, wait, what name where are we on? Hopeful splitter. Mm-hmm. Um, Looking pretty good to get in full price seat in the bottom half of the top 15. Yeah. Now, should she take a bottom half full price seat? <laughs> Is that a good plan? Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know about that. I would. It depends, I guess, on what she wants to do. Uh, if being in the top in a top program is really important to her because she plans to go to big law or have some flexibility in terms of where she moves after school is over, then maybe so. But yeah, in general, I'd be very skeptical. We're always skeptical, right? And she hasn't. She has not rebutted the presumption against paying for law school here. She's just asking, you know, do you think, do we think she can get in? Um, yeah. So um, basically, we need to do less of this stats debating and more just studying for the LSAT. This this splitter is already, I guess, done with the LSAT with the one seventy three. So the things to be doing now are like, boy, get your applications in if you're applying this cycle. Oh no, I'm not mm-hmm. applying until this fall. If I'm not applying until this fall. Oh, what are some things I can do over the next eight months to shore up the weak spots in my application to give me a better chance in the schools ranked seven to 15 range? Not expecting any money due to grades. All right. Well, add some schools below the top 15 and, and fish for scholarships. I mean, you get yourself some offers at least so that you can have something to compare. But but then I don't know what would you do over the next eight months to shore up the weak spots in your application. Hmm. Well, it the weak matter. <laughs> it's like nothing. <laughs> the weak spots are academic, right? So if you can get some job that requires some intellectual prowess and show what you did in eight months, then yeah, that would be nice. But yeah, I mean. <sighs> She's going to write an addendum. She has it said rough first two years. So mm-hmm. if it's better grades in the third and fourth year slash fifth year, um, then yeah, definitely write an addendum pointing out your better performance in the last two years because that's the student that they're getting. Mm-hmm. Three years out of school. So you know if your work experience is impressive and you've achieved things in your job, then you emphasize those in your application. And I think they are going to be a little less concerned about your undergraduate performance. Mm -hmm. But as far as like things you can do over the next eight months, I don't, it's, (laughs) they're making the decision primarily based on your LSAT and your GPA. Those ships have both sailed one of them in the right direction and one of them in the wrong direction. So I I don't know if you, there's just, I don't know. You obviously you want your personal statement to sparkle. Um, you need your letters of recommendation in, you need your resume to make sense and I don't know, enjoy life. Mm-hmm. You've got uh, another, let's see, not applying until yeah. this fall. So another like year and a half to live. Yeah. After that, you're going into law world. So good luck. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Is that a, enough of those two? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, hey, guys. Oh, this is hilarious. We got this yesterday. Hey, guys. Thanks for discussing my questions on the show today. I was turning red from laughter at all the crap you were giving me about my story. It is indeed true, though I am aware of how crazy it all sounds. (laughs) I was kind of hoping that Adam would cut in an excerpt of us talking about this email from last time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But you remember all of the laughs that we were having about how, how crazy all of these... I don't want to go back and rehash it right now, but we, hopefully Adam will cut something in. Any other advice for an older splitter like me? Um, get the best LSAT score you can. Apply broadly. Try not to sound like a crazy person in your application. <laughs> Some students don't do a good enough job of um, pointing out their accomplishments. Like they're too shy about their accomplishments. Yeah. You do not have that problem, splitty. You are really good, but it, it, it just sounds like you're pointing out everything you've ever done in your entire life. So if you really were treasurer for four student organizations simultaneously and you want to point that out, 
okay, but you do not need to also put with a sprinkling of other leadership positions. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> The, the the Trump analogy is just too good. I'm sorry, Splitty. Uh, maybe you like Trump, and that's that's a good thing. But like, it's just how he talks, right? It's it's always vague and vacuous. So there's no way to like. Yeah, yeah. So Splitty, and by the way, Splitty, we 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 believe you. It's just that this sounds so crazy. So you gotta, you're just gonna have to do a better job of explaining yourself, and you're gonna have to choose what to focus on. And, you know, junior year, I started consulting for the government and publishing scientific research papers on the side. (laughs) (laughs) What? (laughs) Like, you're just tossing off a scientific research paper over here. (laughs) Yeah, over the weekend, I did this. Scientific research paper. Yeah, right. In finance with your shitty grades, with your 2.76, because, oh, I was, uh, no, I, I didn't have time to show up for my exam because I, I, I was too busy publishing this important science. Yeah. Like on what? Seriously? Yeah. This is very hard to believe. I think no one has ever said the words publishing scientific research papers on the side. <laughs> this is the first time anyone has ever, ever expressed that thought. Like you're just tossing them off. Like, oh, what'd you do this weekend? Ah, uh, I published a scientific research paper. You know, <laughs> how about you? <laughs> Did you study for your exam? No, <laughs> no. I, I was busy publishing a scientific research paper and raising VC funding <laughs> and winning a variety of awards. <laughs> like I'm imagining Splitty in like a tuxedo <laughs> on some red carpet, getting getting all these accolades. The paparazzi is flashing (laughs) oh man (laughs) hilarious hilarious and currently director of operations for a relatively large global corporation Hmm. okay awesome hey splitty why why on earth do you want to go to law school (laughs) we just kept going back to it that was the thing (laughs) It was really funny. (laughs) Anyway, Splitty, this is Splitty. As Splitty says, as an ardent anti-Trumper, I cringed at the comparison, but I see your point. The vague descriptions in my email were mostly a symptom of trying to summarize things briefly, since I know how much you hate walls of text. Anyway, I'm doing my best to provide all this background in my applications without appearing as crazy as I seemed in that email. Ha ha. I do appreciate your feedback about the addendum. I'll keep that part straightforward and let my resume do the explaining for me. Cheers to you guys, as always. Splitty. P.S. Shout out to the comedian turned Italian food importer turned lawyer from the last episode. He strikes me as a kindred spirit. LOL. (laughs) That's that's good times. Um, I would like to see that resume, man. Uh, hey, Splitty, send us a copy of your resume. I'd love to take a look at that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, that must be looking pretty impressive. And I guess I didn't. we didn't think about that, but if you have all this crazy accomplishments, I mean, it should be reflected on your resume. And uh, yeah. the resume might make it all make sense. By the way, when you're doing your resume, uh, you want to provide bullet points of substance, right? Sometimes people like to just have five or six bullet points for each job or something. And three of those bullet points are utterly unimpressive and they clutter what's really happening. Right? You don't have to show that you did a ton of stuff at your job. You just have to show that you did one or two things that were noteworthy and worth uh, pointing out. So, you know, sometimes they say things like helped schedule meetings with high up executives. Like, no one gives a shit about that. Um, yeah. If you helped prepare a, a report, uh, or maybe even you prepared a report that influenced, you know, com- company policy. That's much more interesting, and you should really just have that, and not have everything muddied down by all these other stupid tasks that you had. We all have, but they're just not impressive, and they hide the important stuff. Totally, and yeah, when you put um, when you put things like that on the resume, then it makes it look it like undermines the value of everything else on the resume. Because it makes it look like you're just putting every single thing you ever did in your entire life on the resume. <laughs> you want to consider leaving off some achievements 
if they're not like mm-hmm. really impressive, just don't even say them. And then the reader will think, oh, wow, if they did these impressive things, they must have done other impressive things too. Instead, you're like scheduled meetings and it's like, <clears throat> oh, okay. Well, you're putting literally everything you did, you mm-hmm. know, made coffee. Like, okay, great. Good job. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> People think that they like, if they, they want to make it look like, oh, look, I was doing all of these tasks. Like I was very busy. Mm -hmm. But nobody wants to read about your busy tasks. They want to read about your like achievements and accomplishments and stuff. So all those bullet points describing your job, I mean, put the one thing that was the most important and probably leave everything else off. Yeah. Cool. Um, I can't believe it, Ben, but we're down to the last email in our agenda here. Yeah, this is amazing. How did this happen? I feel like a bunch of stuff got, did you go through and edit, like remove a bunch of old stuff or something? I removed stuff that we talked about. Oh, wow. That we had read on the show. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. All right. Cool. All right. So, hi, Ben and Nathan. Your next beer is on me. Just donated $15 to your show. Thanks for the tremendous value you put out every week. I have two questions. Do either of you have a good strategy for attacking rule substitution questions on the games? If I miss any on Logic Games, it usually is this question type. Um, yeah, I guess my standard advice is that the wrong answers are either going to be too strong or too weak. They tend to go too far or they don't go far enough. You're being asked to take a rule in the original set of rules, get rid of that rule, and then replace that rule with a new rule in one of the answer choices that will recreate the exact same scenario or the exact set of, exact same set of constraints that the original set of rules created. So when I look at the answers, like if I look at answer choice A, and it says something that could not have happened under the original set of rules, then that answer choice is too strong because it's constraining the game more than it was originally constrained. And that makes it wrong. Uh, Or if another answer choice says something that allows the one of the variables to float around more than it could have floated around before, then that answer choice is too weak and it's not doing enough to recreate the original conditions. Yep. <clears throat> Just to back it up for people who have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, there's a type of question in the logic games. It's almost always, no, it is always has been historically that could change, but it has historically <laughs> always been <laughs> The last question on a game. Mm -hmm. It sometimes appears on two games, uh, which I'm looking right now. It actually did. It was the last question on game three and the last question on game four of prep test Mm -hmm. 83. Um, And the question sounds like which one of the following, if substituted for the constraint that if R stays open, then M must also stay open would have the same effect in determining which stations close and which stations stay open. So it's asking you to, to yeah, it takes one of the rules in the original setup and it, it says which of these five answers, A, B, C, D, and E, would have the exact same effect on the game. And yeah. yeah, I think you're right. Everything Ben said, yeah, we, you're going to, I see it as like a two part process of elimination where you're going to get rid of things that do more than the original rule. And you're also going to get rid of things that do less than the original rule. Mm-hmm. We argued about this, Ben, on, uh, on episode one of the podcast, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Way back, which has been now, what, three and a half years ago. Crazy. We uh, yeah we uh, we argued about the rule substitution question because I thought then and I still do think now that you certainly can't hurt yourself if you just outright skip these questions. I think you probably agree with that, Ben. I agree, especially if you if you find yourself struggling with games or not finishing the games. Why spend time on a question that most people spend a lot of time on? Why not just spend it on one more question that's more likely to be a normal question near the well, end? Well, especially because you know most games start with a list question, 
mm-hmm. where the the answers are going to just list out all of the players in all of the spots. And those list questions are so, so easy. I mean, you can just do process of elimination, take a rule, knock out answer choices. And so if there's five minutes left or four minutes left, and you're looking at number 17, and it's a rule substitution question, in that four minutes, you can guaranteed get number 18 right if it's a list question. Yeah. And you might also be able to get more than just number 18 in that next game. Mm-hmm. And so if if you're going to spend five minutes working on this rule substitution question, that's a guaranteed uh, disaster. So I still teach my classes. I mean, until you're, when you get like really good at the games, then these rule substitution questions get a lot easier. And I have mm-hmm. had students who, you know, say, oh, these rule substitution questions are, are actually really easy for me. Yeah. But even those students, I mean, there are versions of this rule substitution question that are really easy, but there are also versions that are really hard. Mm-hmm. And so the way I teach it now is basically, I, I've actually, this is like the only time I'll ever say this, but I encourage people to half-ass it. Yeah. Like read the rule that they're asking you to substitute, skim the answer choices if something jumps out at you, that very likely might be the answer. It also might be one of the traps, but as long as you don't spend too much time on it, you can just pick what you think is probably the answer and then move on to the next game. Yeah. Um, for this correspondent, it looks like they're finishing and they want like a, a surefire method for how to do it. But I think my advice still stays the same for like 90% of students which is basically don't do these questions. If you skip it outright, randomly guess and move on to the next game, you cannot hurt yourself with that strategy. So that's a pretty easy safety default strategy for most people, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you get good at the games, then these questions are, you know, they're definitely manageable. Mm -hmm. It's just that I stumble over it every time I teach it. And like, I can see, you know, I can, I, I'm making eye contact with the students in the class and mm-hmm. I can just see, I mean, it doesn't happen all that often, but like, this is one of the times where I can just see people's brain just shutting off. <laughs> like the, yeah. it just goes right over their heads. And I try so hard to explain it in a million different ways, but it just goes right over their heads. And then I'm like, yep, you know what you, you should skip it. And most of you should just skip it. Yeah. Um, I like because just because it can't hurt you, I think is the, is the thing where like, that's what makes the decision point for me that the skipping this question, it's only worth one point. And so if you just take two seconds and just go, Oh, nope. Rule substitution question, skip, go on to the next one. I still like that plan. Um, yeah. So can you say, can you say again oh. how, how you, no, because I wanted to, I actually want to go a little deeper though and talk about how to answer it if you are going to answer it. Yeah. Uh so what I do is I actually take the rule that they're talking about and I'll often sometimes I'll circle it even in That's the That's original- what I do. Yeah. Like if it's a if it's a web of sequencing rules. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? A bunch of sequencing rules that connect together. Mm-hmm. I'll circle the rule that they're asking me to substitute in that web, I'll circle just that rule. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. So yeah, I'll circle that rule and it's now gone. Um, But we need to find an answer that recreates that same constraint on the game and doesn't add any additional constraints, right? So it's got to be strong enough, but not too strong to now change the nature of the game. So as I look through the answers, I just start I just start at the top and I say, okay, answer choice A, does this recreate that rule that's now missing? Um, does it force the same things to happen? And if if uh, it goes too far, if it forces things to happen that didn't have to happen under the original set of rules, then that answer choice is too strong and it's wrong. Um, but uh, answers can also be wrong because they're too weak. In other words, they they do add a new rule, but that rule doesn't do enough to force whatever was removed to happen 
again, right? So we took a rule out and we're putting a new rule in, but the new rule is just too weak. It's not doing enough to constrain the game so things can happen that couldn't happen before. That answer is not good because it's too weak. And so then I would cross out that and move on. And you're looking for an answer that's just right. It's like Goldilocks. You're looking for an answer that is strong enough to replace the rule, but it doesn't go any further than the rule that we've replaced. Uh, it doesn't go any further than the original yeah. set of constraints. Can I give a that that's yes, that is exactly right. Let me give people another mm-hmm. perspective on that. This may or may not be helpful, but I like to talk about it sometimes as the the answer, the correct answer is a must be true according to the original conditions of the game. Yeah. So the correct answer that you're going to pick for this rule substitution question, it if the question just said which one of the following must be true, the correct answer for that rule substitution question is a must be true. Okay? According to the original conditions. But not only that, it also makes the rule that is being substituted into a must be true. Yeah. It's complicated. I know it's not the great greatest way of talking about it. <laughs> well, yeah, another way of thinking about it. I, I mean, I don't know if this is going to help either, but it kind of like what you're saying is it's both necessary and sufficient, right? Ooh, yeah, right. It's so. Which one of these five is necessary according to the original setup of the game? Yes. And which one of the following is also sufficient to replicate this thing that we're being asked to substitute out of the game? Yeah. Ooh. And since it's both, it doesn't go too far, but um, it also is not too weak. <laughs> I've tried, so I th- I did a couple where I did it as a, I actually went through those two steps separately. So what I mean is I first went through all five answers and I said, does this have to be true? 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 Yeah. And then I went through them all again saying, and does it replicate the rule? Does it replicate the rule? Does it replicate the rule? Mm. Um, I found it to be inefficient to do it that way, though. Yeah, yeah. You almost have to ask those two questions maybe at the same time. That's I what I, is. yeah. That, so that's how I'm, I'm doing it as each of the two parts, but I'm looking at them both at the same time for A, and then I'm looking mm-hmm. at them both at the same time for B. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Do we have anything more to say about that? Uh, no, I think that's it's pretty good. There are ones where you can just predict the answer, by the way. Yeah, especially if you've made an inference yeah, or in it, the original set of rules. That's true, that's true. Sometimes it'll be like, the correct answer will be the big inference of the game. Yeah. Um, like, Z must go at 1 o'clock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's just the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Hypothetical. <laughs> yeah. Z must go at one o'clock. That's the answer, you guys. So on a very simple one, a very easy one, like there's a rule that says um, L and M have to go consecutively in a sequencing mm-hmm. game. L and M have to go consecutively. Yeah. And there's a rule that says J has to go before L. Mm-hmm. And then it says which one of the following would have the same effect as J before L. And the answer can be J before M. Yeah. Because if L and M have to go consecutively, <laughs> then the rule J before L has the exact same effect as the rule J before M. Yeah. And that's a very common pattern. That's just an important thing you need to know in the logic games generally. And if the rule substitution question happens at the end of game one or at the end of game two, it's likely that the correct answer is going to be something that straightforward and frequently predictable like that. Mm -hmm. But when the rule substitution question is number 23, they can sometimes hide it in pretty fancy ways. Yeah. Right? Like there'll be conditional reasoning and they'll use the contrapositive, but they'll also trade on the fact that there was a rule that says, you know, if K, no N, and then it'll be like, well, so then you can take those two as opposites of each other. <laughs> it just, it starts getting really complicated, right? Yeah. And so there's ones where you certainly can't predict it. But having both of those approaches is exactly what you want, right? Because like, if you can predict it, 
then you go forward, and when you can't, you start eliminating answer choices. I mean, the best test takers can do that for all the different question types and questions. You just predict when you can, and when you can't, you figure out what you're looking for and know how to eliminate. Yeah, we are uh, always trying to predict, but we don't get too married to our predictions because sometimes we have to do other things. Yeah. So she goes, she continues, Hey, with less than three weeks until the February LSAT, I'm sticking to your one timed section per workday, one full timed practice test on the weekend approach. I bought the LR Encyclopedia. This is on Amazon, by the way. Just search for LR Encyclopedia, Nathan Fox. Thank you. To aug- hmm? Thank you. Yeah, of course. I bought the LR Enc- Encyclopedia to augment this schedule, reviewing a handful of questions during my lunch break. Because I'm unlikely to finish the entire book before the test, would focusing on, say, the 18 to 26 questions be most valuable? In other words, would it be most valuable to focus on the hardest questions? I'm finishing all the LR sections, ranging anywhere from negative 1 to negative 4 per section. Thanks again, Trace. Yeah, it seems like she should focus on the harder ones. Don't you? What do you think? Maybe, although I still tend to think that people can learn more from easier questions. The hmm. the hardest ones, just there's so many of them in there that tend to be just kind of one-off, nasty little tricks. And yeah. so, I mean, Trace, because um, he, she? I would assume she, but I don't know. I know a Trace that's a dude. I think it can go either way. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Because he or she is uh, is getting you know minus one to minus four and finishing the section, that's pretty good. Um, because of that, I think if anyone is going to focus on just the hardest ones, it's probably Trace. Mm-hmm. But my one kind of warning about that is that you could burn yourself out. You could start getting really frustrated because those ones, I mean, not only are they questions 18 through 26, but they're also the ones that my students asked me for help with over the years. Mm -hmm. So it's like the hardest of the 18 to 26 questions are the ones that made it into that encyclopedia. So they're definitely going to be harder, trickier, you know, just in a lot of cases, they're going to be worse questions (laughs) than, than the than the ones that my students never asked me about. Yeah. yeah. It's about half what that is, the encyclopedia is about half of the questions f- half of the logical reasoning questions from prep test 40 through 60. And mm-hmm. it's just the ones that people asked me about and I wrote explanations for and then I decided to lump them all into a giant book. Yeah. So the ones that people ask me about are the trickiest ones. Of mm-hmm. course, right? Yeah. So I just would say, hey Trace, if you're going to do that, don't like let yourself get burned out because you're missing a lot of them. I mean, you're you will probably miss more of those than you would miss on a normal section for sure, and you'll miss more than them than you would on a normal 18 through 26 because this is again, it's just the the ones that people really struggled with. So when I say hardest, I do mean hardest, and there there's going to be some pretty nasty, tricky ones in there, and just don't. Uh, if you do that, don't freak yourself out. Uh, and then, uh, you know, advice for other people who happen to have that book. I mean, if you're if you're more like getting 15 correct per section, you definitely should just focus on the easiest ones or maybe the harder ones, but definitely not the hardest ones in that book because you're they're just beyond your level. It's going to be frustrating, and you'll learn slower from the hardest ones. I think you'll learn you'll learn faster from the easier ones. Yeah. Uh, generally. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for the beer, Trace. Appreciate it. I uh, It'll be another eight days plus before I am able to have that delicious beverage that you purchased. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to make it. Oh yeah, no. I, I it it seemed pretty inevitable from the beginning. I it has been surprisingly easy, and it has been a uh, a refreshing break from the booze, uh, just to sort of recognize the long run, long term effects of what alcohol does to your system. Um, it is a depressant, you know, and mm-hmm. it if you drink a lot, if you drink all the time, it it will just sort of overall, or at least for me, it, it like was definitely like 
impacting my overall mood. Mm. Uh, so I'm noticing myself in better spirits generally over the last uh, 23 days than I was in the like previous three year bender that I have been on. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm um, I don't think I'm going to become a teetotaler, but I do intend to be uh, more thoughtful about it when I come back to the drinking. I think I'll enjoy it more and uh, also still be able to uh, have a little healthier relationship with it. A little, little distance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, but it's been, uh, it's been no sweat. I've been, <laughs> I've been eating a ton of ice cream. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is goddamn delicious, by the way. Ice cream is so good. What's your favorite flavor? Oh, man. Well, pistachio default. Pistachio. What? Absolutely. Ugh. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Oh, what? <laughs> Don't hate on pistachio. I can't stand it. What do you mean you can't stand it? I well, don't like pistachio ice cream. Hold on. You're talking about the like artificial green food coloring nasty pistachio. Okay, tell me about the the royal, elegant, natural, all, well, all powerful, it's just, real pistachio it, ice cream. It's it's just like a subtle the flavor of the pistachio nut, like not some artificial. <laughs> do you not like a pistachio? I like pistachios. Yeah, I do. Okay, so good pistachio ice cream has a lot of pistachios in it. First of all, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it gets that crunchy thing. Mm-hmm. But it also is just like a, no, just like, you know, it's kind of like a normal ice cream base flavor, like a sort of like vanilla y kind of a flavor with mm-hmm. a little tiny, like nutty kind of thing. It's not yeah. like over the top. Pistachio is a, is a very, if, if it's good, it's like a just delicate thing. Not the neon green thing that you're thinking of. Mm-hmm. Not that has to be what you're thinking of. Also, you just need to go to, um, we're having like an ice cream renaissance these days. Are you aware of this? No. Uh, that's because you don't like really live in like a hipster kind of a place, right? You kind of live in the like out in the country, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, When you when you live in L.A. or you go to like hipster kinds of places, there's like fancy ice cream joints everywhere, which is a trend that I heartily approve of. Mm -hmm. So you can go around and buy like a six dollar ice cream cone, and the six dollar ice cream cones are just absolutely delicious, and they have all kinds of crazy wacky flavors. Like I had. <clears throat> One the other day, I had um, black olive brittle in a uh, like goat cheese ice cream base, mm-hmm. and it was very tangy, like it was super like salty and sour kind of thing. Black olive what? Brittle black olive brittle. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. This was uh, in Studio City. This was at Salt and Straw in Studio City. Okay. Um, but no, last night I had just normal, I had butter pecan last night. Mm-hmm. God, it was good. What's your favorite yeah. ice cream? Uh, I like like a, a raspberry or something, sometimes, yeah, something with uh, raspberry or blueberry or something like that. Now, like yeah. a sherbet or in like an ice cream? Uh, you know, I get this stuff at the store that's... I don't feel like it's a sherbet. It's not. It just seems um, it's something different. I don't know what it is, actually. But I don't know that it's ice cream either. You're too to be healthy. Honest, mm, I'm not getting it for health reasons. It's it's uh, it's a good ice cream. I don't know what it is though. Is it actually ice cream though? That oh, it's sound- ice cream. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's it's like I eat one of those things and it's. I think it says it has like. <laughs> two servings or something and one serving has like 58 you know percent of your saturated fat so i'm like oh i just ate i just ate the whole thing so that yeah i just got all of my not that i actually care about that obviously since i'm eating it and enjoying it yeah if it doesn't have like 500 calories per serving it's not ice cream that's yeah no that's this, a this good does. rule of thumb good good well that's <laughs> good that's, that's what you're doing i mean it's not yeah. like do you know what is absolute garbage uh, Halo Top, Halo Top. Have you heard of this? Mm-mm. It comes in a pint, like it looks like a Ben and Jerry's. It looks like an ice cream. Mm-hmm. It looks like you're getting ice cream, and you open it up, and it totally looks like ice cream. And you scoop it out, and you start eating it, and it tastes like 
air. It's like it's like we removed all of the good part of ice cream and just left the illusion of ice cream. It's yeah, <laughs> it's like that's weird. It's like eating a mirage. It's just the fucking worst. I don't know who thinks that stuff is good. If please write into the show and we can mock you if you think that that stuff is good ice cream because it's it is it's not ice cream. They should put it in a separate section. It shouldn't even be in the freezer next to the ice cream. Should be like the self deception section. Just there delusional. Should, yeah, there should be like a FDA warning label on the side of it. Like on like how on a pack of cigarettes, I would totally support on the the hollow top needs to have that same thing that says Surgeon General's warning. This is not actually ice cream at all. It looks it's in a pint thing that makes it look like ice cream, but you will be sad if you it, it's immense <laughs> sadness will occur if you eat this because it's awful. Yeah. All right. Anyway, that's my um, ice cream related content for the day. Cool. Cool. Um, is that it for the for the day? Uh, I have one final request. So oh, whenever nice. we start the episodes, we start out by saying hello and welcome to episode yada yada. This is yada 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 yada. So anyway, um, we have a nice way of starting the show, and or I don't know if it's nice. Maybe no one likes it, but it's it a makes thing, it easy. though. Yes. <laughs> But we don't have a good way of ending the show, or at least a consistent way. And so maybe we'll experiment with some today. But if you have any ideas, dear listeners, please tell us. We'd love to know how to end the show. Should we just say, you know, goodbye? May <laughs> may Elsa <laughs> may Elsa peace be with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, that would take a really religious tone. Or we could have no, you know, like may the force be with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, peace just makes me think of religion for some reason. Peace. It makes yeah. me think of hip hop. But all right. Well, you know, like I don't know. It seems like religious. We could be like Ben sermon. and Nathan out this bitch. Out this bitch. <laughs> okay, that's an option. Okay. Um, yeah. What else? I don't know. Um, if we could do the microphone drop, but it's audio, so the mic drop wouldn't. Wouldn't work. Wouldn't wouldn't see anything. You could hear the the mic dropping though, and then it's just over. <laughs> That's true. I mean, we'd have to buy new buy new equipment sometimes for after we dented our shit all up. No, no, Adam. Adam would just make up. He'd just download a mic drop sound. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, we do need some sort of a tagline or some sort of a some sort of a sign off. I agree because it's always so awkward when we say goodbye. It's something about not stressing out or don't stop thinking about strategies. I don't know. You know what I love to say? Chill out. Yeah. It, 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 it really pisses people off, but I love, to, I love to do it. I love to say, when I say goodbye to my friends, especially my close friends, I love to say, as I'm the last thing as I'm leaving, I love to say, nice knowing you. I love it. Oh, yeah. It's a little mm-hmm. dark, mm-hmm. But, it, but it's also like, I, it, it has been. It has been so nice knowing you. And yeah, I mean, we are going to drop dead one of these days, and that would be the last thing I said. Yeah, so you'd be ready. You're always ready. Yeah, nice knowing you. And it doesn't mean, and it doesn't like have to mean I'm never going to see you again. It's just nice mm-hmm. knowing you. It's just like a little compliment. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's we'll give funny. that one a shot. What? That, that's funny you say that because I I don't say that, but I have said something similar. I don't do it as frequently as you do, but it would be like, yeah, what was it? It's not like I have a good life, <laughs> but it was, it's kind of like that. I can't remember what I, I, I used to say this a lot more frequently and um, definitely in the context, it was, you know, not acceptable. It was, oh, uh, what did you say? Nice knowing you. Nice knowing you. I like that. It's casual. Yeah. It's just it a little toss-up. It has the same up. feeling, but it wasn't that exactly. Um, maybe it was, yeah. I'll have to think of it. There's, there's things that are like that. Cool. Yeah, I think we should use that for now. Nice knowing you. Okay. Well, um, oh, we did need to give out the email address for sure, because we're now officially out of shit to talk about. If you would like us to do an episode next week... <laughs> 
you please want drop this us to a continue. Line. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's help at thinkingelsat.com. And that comes to both of us. And uh, we might just respond, which we've been doing a lot lately because we've been like worried about our backlog of emails. So yeah. we've been just like responding by a quick email and not putting it on the agenda. But right now, since we're starved for next week's show, uh, this is a really good time to get your uh, to get famous mm-hmm. by emailing us, and um, we will put you on the agenda because we really don't know what we're going to talk about next time. Yeah, we do need to go back to uh, the June two thousand seven test and finish up the reading comprehension and the games. Mm-hmm. So we always have that, that we can go for. But um, we'd like to talk about some news and updates and stuff from our listeners. So drop us a line, help at thinkingelset.com. Uh, again, one more pitch for uh, helping us out on the internet by going to our YouTube channel. That's uh, youtube.com slash thinkingelset and hit the subscribe button. Uh, give us a review, give us a share, all that type of shit. Go to Stitcher. If you're a Stitcher Android person, go to Stitcher and subscribe to the show. Give us a rating and review. Um, you can also help us out on Twitter. We've been sending out the episodes now on, um, at thinking LSAT. So you can follow us there. If you want show updates, anything else? That's it. All right. Um, it's been nice knowing you.